Hi everybody, Scott Stanchfield here. Let's set up a Google Maps project. And what we're actually going to do is set up two projects. Unfortunately, Google Maps isn't set up for use in Jetpack Compose quite yet. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a normal Google Maps activity, which is using the old view structure for Google Maps, and then copy some files over into a Jetpack Compose project and set up a bridge so we can use the actual Google Maps view inside our Compose application. If all that sounds like a mess, it's really not too bad. You'll see exactly what we're going to do in a second here. So to start with, we're going to pick Google Maps Activity when we're creating a new project and hit Next. And I'm going to make this be view-based maps, something like that. And that's going to create a new project for us. And when the project opens up, notice that it opens up this Google Maps API XML. That's, we're going to need that file. We're going to need to edit it to put our key from the Google uh, API console. I'm going to switch over. Instead of using the Android view here, I'm going to switch over to the project view because I just prefer that more. And for this Google Maps API, I'm going to click inside the editor and then go to this little target doohickey here on the, the view tree. When I click on it, you'll notice that it opens up where the file is in the tree. That's a really useful little guy to help locate which file you're actually editing. Notice that it's created it underneath the application, app, source, debug, res, values. There's our Google Maps API. There's also one underneath app source release res values. And this is for the release version of the application. This is for the debug version of the application. We're going to be working with the debug version here. I'm going to just give ourselves a little more room to see what's going on. And you'll see in here it's actually giving you instructions for how to get that Google Maps API key. This link here, if you just control click on it, it'll open up in the browser for you. So we'll see in here, we can create a project. The project, I've already got one I call Carfighter. I'm just going to use it. I'm going to hit continue. Inside here, it's automatically created a Maps SDK uh, for Android enablement here. They have this set up so it'll actually kind of walk through the process for you. If you're not doing it this way, like let's say that I did a Google API console. I just search for it. This will take me to my existing console. You could go to your dashboard and hit this button that says Enable APIs and Services. And from there, you can just click on the services that you want to enable, and it'll let you toggle it on and off. The Maps SDK for Android is the one that we're interested in here. So now we're going to create an API key to actually uh, call the API. We need to actually create that so that Google knows it's us making the Maps requests. We hit this Create API Key button. And it takes you to the credentials section with a new key that it's created. If you need to create one manually rather than going through this process, you can go to the credentials tab and hit create credentials and choose API key. So see that it's actually created this new key here for us, this API key 3, with an Android's app restriction on it. And it actually put in our information for us. So if we hit uh, the edit button on this, we'll take a look and it says it's restricted for Android apps and it has my package name and my key in there, the, the digital signature. So it's automatically set everything up. If you weren't working through that process, what we could do is go and create credentials, API key. Now it gives you the key without any restrictions. We can hit restrict key. And then from there, choose Android apps, add an item, and add in the package name in the SHA-1 fingerprint. That link did most of the work for us, which is actually really nice. It tends to change from time to time on how that works, but they've actually gotten that process down so that when you just click on that link, most of it's nice and automatic, which I really appreciate. So I am going to delete that one that I just created there. Now we'll note here that I have a couple other keys that I created earlier today when I was working with the example code and I created these without any restrictions. That's just a little bit of a shortcut so that uh, if we're doing any type of grading, instead of having to pull in everybody's individual information into a key, we just make it unrestricted and then delete the key as soon as we're done doing the grading. That way we're minimizing the window of exposure that somebody else could possibly use the key. Now the key may take five minutes or a little longer to actually be active. Sometimes it's up almost immediately, but it might need to give it a little bit of time. What we're going to want to do is copy the key ID over here. You can just hit this little button here to copy the key. 
And then we can go back to our application. And we're going to go down here. And where it says your key here, we're just going to paste it in. And boom, now we have our key in place there. So we're all set setting up our key there. Our maps activity, this is using the old version of using map fragments, is set up to just create the map fragment. Well, we're actually doing it inside of the activity maps binding. Let's take a look at him under source main res layout activity maps. This is the old version here. This was using a fragment. And what a fragment does, he has his own life cycle. So he's aware of how the user's interacting. Is the user leaving? Is the user entering? Is things Are things being created, destroyed? All of that type of information. And he can manage his life cycle. You'll see that when we do this, we're actually going to have to manage that life cycle manually because we're not using a fragment. We have to use a view when we bind it into Jetpack Compose. So keep that in mind. We're going to have to set up our life cycle on him. So once we have that, he's actually going and finding that fragment and then calling map fragment get map async. This is going to end up calling this on map ready callback, which they have set up as being an interface that maps activity implements. Just a little side note, I'm not really keen about making the activity itself implement the interface. I'm really of the mind that when you say something implements an interface, you're really creating an ISO relationship. And the map on map ready callback really should be its own object and it should be nested inside the maps activity. We're not going to have to worry about that here. We're going to see later on with Jetpack Compose that we're going to use a lambda, which represents this on map ready callback. But just in general, it, it kind of makes me uneasy when we use an interface at the top level here, because now this maps activity could be used anywhere that a map on map ready callback is needed, even if it were in a different activity. And I think that's a little problematic uh, because it'll actually come up when you do content assist, for example. So uh, try to avoid that in general, but that's the way they set up their template here. Now this get map async call here is going to get a Google map object from the map fragment, which is basically your interface to interact with the map. And then it's going to call the uh, on map ready function inside whatever callbacks passed in. Well, since we're actually implementing at the interface level, we'll see that the on map ready is just defined inside the activity. This takes that Google map that we retrieved and just holds on to it in the field so that we can do things with it. And all they're doing in this example is putting a marker in Sydney and then moving the camera there. So to run it, I'm going to switch over to a uh, emulator because I happen to have a tablet plugged in, which is why it came up there. So we're going to go ahead and run this. Now note that I've turned the emulator uh, it's such that it's running outside of Android Studio. It's not actually running in a tool window. And the reason for this is there's actually a, a an option that we need to get to that for some reason they haven't implemented inside the tool window. So I'm just going to drag the emulator over here so you can see it. And the option that I'm looking at is this little dot, dot, dot doesn't seem to be working inside Android Studio right now. So when I hit it, it brings up this extra extended controls. And this is going to be really useful, this location tab because we can set our location to wherever we want it to be. Just scroll somewhere, click on a point, and then say set location, and it'll say that that is the current location. I'm just gonna put it where it thinks I am right now, because I think that's the one that I set before. Oops, I set it for Cockeysville again. Let me come back down here. That's good enough. So we have a current location there, and now in our maps activity here, he's not actually using that current location data. We're going to actually use that in one of ours. I just wanted to show you this panel here and why I'm not doing it inside Android Studio. So I'm just going to close this panel down. But we'll see here that the maps came up and it actually has a point listed in Sydney. Now a couple points about how you can control the maps inside of an emulator. What we need to do is pinch and zoom. And with a mouse, it's kind of hard to do that. If you hold down the control key, you're going to see a couple little points come up that look like where your fingers are. And so if we click and drag, that can do a pinch. Now I'm not clicking. I'm coming back in. I'm going to click and drag, and that zooms in. I can pan just using the mouse as is. I'm going to, once again, click and drag, and then click and drag, and so on. And so this is how you could do your pinch and zoom 
inside the emulator. It's a little bit rough, but hey, it works. So this is using just the view-based version of the maps activity. And the things that we're going to need out of here are going to be these Google Maps API files and the manifest. Let's take a look at the manifest real quick. Notice how down here there's this metadata, and you'll see that it's actually brought that key value in. It's reading that from that Google Maps API file. We'll see the string Google Maps key is defined inside this file. There's also one defined in the release file so that you know when you're building a release version of the application, it'll pull the key from this file. When you're building the debug version, it'll build it from this file up here. So those are the three files we're going to care about for copying over. Let's go ahead and create our Jetpack Compose based project. So I'm going to say File New Project. Choose Compose Activity. And we're going to call this Compose map let's call it simple compose map because i already have a project called compose map and the first thing we're going to do is copy over those files let me let it sync switch over to my project view i'm going to expand the app directory and he has source main but he doesn't have that debug in the release directory so i'm going to want to copy those over let me go over to the other project and I'm going to grab the debug directory from source and the release directory. I'm just going to copy those by hitting control C, go back over, and then I'm going to paste them into the source directory. And so now we have the source debug and the source release version of those files. Now we're going to need to add our fingerprint and this new package name. Notice that when I copied it, it still has the old package name. It'd be nice to be able to update that. The fingerprint should still be the same because we're using the same debug certificate. We're running inside the same Android Studio. But we're going to need a different package name. We can get that package name from the app build.gradle file. And we'll see here that there's our application ID, Java Dude Simple Compose Map. I'm just going to keep this consistent. I'm going to copy him over into here just to make sure that that's the right thing. And we're going to also change it here for the key. I'll go ahead and paste that so that if we use this link, it'll actually set it up for the right key. And let's actually tweak inside the release one as well here. Oh, he doesn't have any data in there, so we don't need to do it in there. Next, we need that manifest, that chunk of data from the manifest. So let's go over to the other project. And I'm going to look at that Android manifest. And I'm going to copy this metadata block to our new project. So underneath source, main, Android manifest. We need to put this inside the application block. Just going to paste that there. And that'll read that Google Maps key from this uh, debug file and the release file. Just to make sure, let me control click on this and see where it goes. And we'll see here that he has gone to that debug version. And the reason he's going to the debug version is we look at build variants. We're going to see that we're building the debug variant. If I change this to the release variant and let it sync. Now if I go to my manifest and control click. It's gone to the release version of this guy. If I locate it, he's in the release version. So it's pulling different versions of that file based on which one you click on. I'm going to switch this back over to the debug version, just so we make sure we're using the right key there. And now let's go ahead and create that key again. So I'm going to go into this Google Maps API. Because I've tweaked both the, uh, the link up here and this uh, package name, this link should be OK now. He's using that same key. I'm going to control click on him and I'm going to choose my existing project you can create a new project if you want and continue create the API key we'll see it's created this new key up here for me I'm going to copy him and in my project I'm going to update the actual key listed here now if you double click on this key it may or may not highlight the whole thing. Sometimes some characters inside here will make it stop the highlight. Just make sure you're replacing the entire thing. 
I'm going to paste them in there. And we should be good to go as far as all the, the hookup with the, the Google server is concerned. So let's get him out of the way. We'll close him down, close him down. Now in this particular version of the application, we're not going to be using any location information, so we don't need to add any extra permissions for that. To keep this simple and just to the map components, I'm not going to create a scaffold on this. I'm just going to put it directly in the, uh, the UI here. So let me get rid of this extra stuff down here. Let me get rid of him. And what we're going to want to do is create an instance of a map view. We're not going to use map fragment like the other one did because uh, you can't include fragments inside of Jetpack Compose. But we're going to pull in a view, we're going to remember that view, and then map it into our Jetpack Compose structure. So the first thing we need to do is remember our view here. So I'm going to come in here, it gives us a little more room to work, and we're going to say val map view equals remember, and then we're going to actually create an instance of a map view. Now if I come in here and say map view, Notice that there's nothing to go to because I haven't actually added the dependencies for Google Maps yet. So I'm going to import my remember to start with. And what we're going to need to do is bring in the Google Maps API. There are two dependencies we need. I'm going to come into my app module here and go to build.gradle. And let's add in these two new dependencies. The Maps libraries and the Maps Kotlin extensions here. And while we're at it, I'm going to update a few other things. Let me go to the top level here, change this to 104, which is the current Compose when I'm writing this. 703 is correct, and this should actually be 31, because 104 brought in support for Kotlin 31. I'm going to go back to my build.gradle. Now, if you're using the, uh, the Libs versions TOML that I've got for all these sample projects, you won't have to tweak any of this by hand. But I'm just going to walk you through showing you which ones I'm tweaking here, just so you know what's there in case you want to handle dependencies in a different way. So back underneath the build.gradle for the app, the compose version should be fixed once we sync. JUnit4, I'm going to Alt-Enter on him, replace with a specific version. Oh, hey, that's broken. That's nice. Let's find out what the current JUnit version is. To do that, I'm going to say... JUnit MVN repository. So I can come down here to this guy. And this one, it says the artifact's been moved for later versions. So for JUnit 5, they now call it uh, JUnit Jupiter. We're looking for the latest version of the 4.0 chain. So it's 4.13.2. So back over here, I'm going to make that be 4.13.2. And the reason we're doing this is having that plus there makes it actually check to see what the latest version is every time you do a build. So it slows things down, and you're not locking yourself down to a specific version. So if a new version comes along that's a 4. something and maybe has a bug in it or maybe changes some API, it'll pull that one in. You really want to lock these things down so you know what's going to be built every time you build it. So 4.13.2, these composed versions should get fixed in a second. This guy is obsolete. I'm not sure why they still keep putting it in. So we're going to delete him. And compile for 31. All that looks good. Let's go ahead and do a sync. And hopefully everything's going to be up to date here. Let's come down here and take a look. There we go. So that all looks good now. Much, much better. So now we've got the map stuff in there. We can go back to our main activity. And we're going to come in here and we're going to create a map view. Note that it's letting me import it. Boom, I now have a map view. Now with the old views, you always have to pass in the current context, which in this case is the activity, so that they can get resources and things like that. So I'm going to pass in this. That's the current activity. And we're going to do a little bit of initialization on him. So I'm going to put an apply in there. One of the things you need to make sure you have with the map view is an ID. And it uses this ID when it's saving things when the screen's rotated and things like that. So we're going to put an ID in here. I'm going to say ID equals r.id.googlemap. Now we haven't defined this ID yet, so we're going to need to actually define it in our resources. There are other ways to get IDs. You can ask the view to generate a unique ID for you. I like using a fixed ID here so that if we end up doing any debugging, we can find it more easily. If you were creating a really dynamic UE using the old view approach, 
then creating dynamic uh, view IDs is a good way to go. But for here, what I want to do is go to the source main res. This is underneath the app. And underneath values, I'm going to create a new file here. I'm going to right click and say new values resources file. I'm going to call it IDs. And I'm going to take a look inside here. I'm going to say item name equals Google Map. And type is ID. So that's going to reserve an ID for us and give us a nice name that we can give a handle to it, this Google Map name here. We come back here, boom, our ID Google Map works just fine. So now we've created this map view and we're going to remember it. But in order for this to work, he needs to be aware of the life cycle that's going on with the activity. When the activity is created, when it's started, when it's resumed, stopped, paused, and destroyed. All of those need to forward to the equivalent methods inside the map view so that he can do some saving of data and restoring of data and things like that. And so he knows when he's actually being created to be put on the screen. To do that, we're going to create a life cycle observer. And when we're using that observer, we're going to have it keep track of the different st states inside the activity and then forward calls to the map view automatically for us. To do that, we're going to need to bring in the lifecycle support. So I'm going to go to my app and look at his build.gradle. And we're going to add in an implementation for the lifecycle runtime library. Runtime KTX gives you the Kotlin extension so that we can use it in a more Kotlin native format. I'm going to sync that. And what we want to do is we want to set up a lifecycle observer such that when we come into, in this case, this surface that we're creating in Compose, it'll attach that lifecycle observer. And when the surface is destroyed, we want to dispose that observer. So, and when I say destroyed, I mean it's actually when it's part of the Compose tree, it'll be added. When it's not part of the Compose tree, it'll be removed. To do this, we use something called a disposable effect. And disposable effect gives you a block of code that's executed when the, uh, the composition happens initially for this guy. It'll be rerun anytime one of the keys change. And then there's an on dispose we can set up so that when he's thrown away, we can get rid of it. Now, in this particular case, there's going to be two keys that we're concerned with. One is if the life cycle changes, and the other is if the map view changes. So those are our two keys. So I'm going to come in here and say life cycle and map view as our keys. And then I'm going to put a lambda in here for the actual effect that we're running. And this effect is going to run when the either the life cycle or the map view changes or when I first compose this. So inside this effect, I'm going to create an observer and add and remove it. Let's give ourselves a little more room to work here. We'll say val observer equals lifecycle event observer and this observer has two uh, arguments to him the lifecycle owner who is the activity and the actual event that's being signaled as changing now we already know what our owner is so I can just use an underscore saying I don't care about that argument then I'll pass in event as the ar other argument there in order to reduce all this red that we're seeing the problem here is that we haven't set up a dispose function inside of this disposable effect. And if I just keep typing, it's just going to make everything red. Let me set up the dispose to start with here. So I'm going to come in here and say on dispose, and that'll make things happy because the disposable effect wants to make sure that we define what to do when we're disposing. Now everything's nice and non-red. I like that. That's so much easier. We're going to take a look at the event, and based on what it is, we're going to call the corresponding functions in the map view. So I'm going to say when event, and we'll say lifecycle.event.onCreate. So if it's on create, I'm going to call map view on create. And we're going to pass in the same saved instance state that was passed to us. This is used whenever we uh, have the activity being created and recreated it'll actually pass in this state when the activity is recreated. Let's say it's on a configuration change. You can save some data during the pause or the stop, and then when we're recreated, 
it passes that data back so we can recreate information. This map view is doing the same thing. He's going to have some state that he saves, and he wants to restore it. So I'm going to pass in that saved instance state. And then we're going to have several other ones here. So we're going to have our on start, and this will just call on start. Then we're going to have our on resume. And then we're going to have our, actually, that's, a, that, yeah, resume. And then this should be a pause, stop. and destroy. Now if it's anything else, we're just going to throw a legal state exception, make sure it's the Kotlin one, unhandled life cycle event. Let's just make sure I have the right ones here. Should be six, create, start, resume, pause, stop, destroy. That should be good there. So all we're doing here is when the when the activity changes state, we're changing the state inside the map view and letting him know what's going on. Note that you don't need to do this with normal Jetpack Compose, composable functions, but when you're trying to pull in a view from the old system into Jetpack Compose, you'll often need to do some kind of mapping like this. Once we have that observer, we're actually going to add it. So I'm going to say lifecycle dot add observer observer. And then in the on dispose, I'm just going to change that to be remove observer. So now this disposable effect, anytime the life cycle and map view changes, it's going to dispose the previous one, create a new observer, add it. If also the surface goes out of the tree, and in this case that'll only happen when we're actually getting out of the activity, it will call the dispose for whatever the current one is. So that'll set up the actual listening for us. Now let's add in the view itself. So make sure I'm in the right spot here. That looks good there. I'm going to do that by bringing in an Android view. And he needs a factory to create the view. Now depending on what you're creating, sometimes it's just a matter of calling, you know, for example, map view passing in this. We can't do that because our uh, map view is a little bit more complex to set up. We have to do this setup and then have all this disposable effect. If we created it in the factory itself, we wouldn't have a handle to it. By doing it in this remember, we have a handle to it that we can call inside this disposable effect and in other places to do some actions. So all we're gonna do with our factory here is have that return the map view. But keep in mind for simpler views, you would just be creating it inside there. And now we're going to say what to do after the view's been created, after maybe any type of information behind the scenes been inflated. So if he had references to some XML layouts, those would be inflated. After everything's ready, this update will be called. And notice that it passes the actual object from the factory in there. So it's just the map view that we have here. Now what we're going to want to do is once this thing's inflated, we need to get the Google Map instance from it so that we can communicate with that to do some interesting things. To do this, I'm going to say val Google Map equals it dot await map. But this is a suspend function. So we need to do that inside of a coroutine. Let's create a coroutine scope for him. Remember coroutine scope. And I'm going to say scope dot launch. and put this inside of here. Boom, there we go. So now we have our we're map. It's trying to get it. It's going to wait until it's actually gotten. And then once we hit this line, we'll know that we have a valid Google map to do things with. So we can now do some things like adding markers on the map. Let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to say Google map dot add marker. And we're going to need to pass in some map information there. That's actually the wrong one. Let's control space on him and make sure I pull in the one that has the curly braces. So notice how he's now gone italic. This is actually an extension function in those Kotlin extensions for the map to add a marker. And this guy here is going to take a block that has some actions that we're going to run. So in here, what we're going to do is just set his position to something. To do that, we need a position. 
let's create a position. I'll just do it up over here. I can say val camera pose, oh, camera position. See if I can spell. And we're going to remember him so we don't recreate him every time. It's going to be a lat long, passing in a latitude and a longitude. which we need somewhere. Let's go ahead and define a, a decent latitude and longitude. I'm just going to paste these in right up at the top of the file here. And if those change, I'm going to say latitude and longitude, I want to recreate that camera position. Now in this case the latitude and longitude are basically constants. I'm going to go ahead and move them up there and make them constants. But if somewhere above somebody changed that, so the latitude and longitude were defined some other way, this would recreate that camera position whenever the latitude and longitude change. Otherwise, if the latitude and longitude are the same, it's just going to reuse that same lat long instance, which is really nice. So I'll put the camera position in here. We're going to add the marker there. And then what we'd like to do is actually move to that camera position. So let's do a Google map dot animate camera and we're going to pass in a camera update for it. The camera update just describes the action we're doing with the camera. We're moving it around. So we're going to use the camera update factory dot new lat long zoom and we're going to pass in that camera position and let's use like a 15 as our zoom factor there. Now notice that there are a couple other arguments to animate camera here. There's an int and a callback. The int is how long we want to take to do that animation. So over what time the animation takes place. I'm going to pass in a thousand to say it's going to be a one second animation. And then we don't have any type of special cancelable callback that we want to do there. So this should animate to that location over a second. And hopefully when we run this, this will actually work now. So let's try running it. I'm going to bring the emulator that I defined over here. And here we're getting our map screen, but we're seeing that our map screen is all gray. So when you have a gray screen like this, what we need to do is try to figure out what's going on. And the log cat used to be a little bit more useful here. Most of the time what the problem is that there's a problem with the key hooking up to, to the, uh, the Google Play console. The log cat used to actually provide a, a pretty clear message saying, hey, your key is mismatching. Um, unfortunately, it seems like some of that is gone now, or, or at least it's not showing up using the, the map view directly like we're doing here. So the first thing we want to do is try to make sure, did we set the key up properly? And let's take a look at that Google Maps API that we're used here. And, you know, I could have sworn we edited that, but apparently we did not. So that's probably our problem. Let's just double check. If we look at the credentials here, Let's edit the one that we're using. And yeah, there's the problem. You see how it has com Java dude view based maps instead of the, the, the new application ID. So I definitely did that one wrong. So I'm going to come back here and let's delete that key and start over again. Not sure what happened there. Let's hit delete. Maybe I accidentally hit undo. And now let's actually fix this again. I'm going to go to my manifest copy this com java dude simple compose map. Um, I could also have gone to the build.gradle here and there he is there. So it's highlighted like I did him before but for some reason let's go ahead and replace it here. So I'm going to paste that and then I'm going to also replace it on the end of this link. And let's try control clicking that link again. And now go back to my car finder project, continue, create API key, and let's grab the new API key that it just created. I'm going to double check that it actually put the right thing in here. So this looks like the right information now. Let's go back to the app and replace the key down here again. 
Here's one of those cases when I double click, notice it didn't pick the whole thing. We want to replace the whole thing there. And now let's try rerunning it. And there we go, the app actually ran. So if I uh, come out of here again, I'm just gonna go ahead and swipe away all this stuff here that's in there. So if I run this guy again, notice that the map is zooming over and putting us at a location with that marker on MP6, which is the building I work in at APL. So far, so good. So we actually have a map showing up. That's actually pretty useful. 